Yeah. Then I've got to check the time and see if it's afternoon. <laughs> um, good afternoon, guys. Um, my name is Mort Mabana. Um, also known as M7 Official Media. I'll go into that later. But um, I'm going to talk about my experience with um, like mental health issues such as depression, psychosis, but also talk about suicide. Um, so my journey started off as um, I'm a, I was a young black boy growing up in Newton, um, Lee Grave. Um, it was just me and my mum. Uh, didn't see my dad like here and there, but it was like I, I see him like once or twice a week. So I, I knew who my dad was, but he didn't live with us basically. So yeah, um, what we did was I went to school. Um, Got decent grades, but same time I was a one of the class clowns basically in school. Um, but I left school with eight GCSEs. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, so I went into college, but um, college had its ups and downs. But basically, from the age of like 13. Um, when I weren't playing football or rugby or, or doing any other activities, I was out on the streets like trying to make money basically. So I was just involved in like dealing, drug dealing and stuff like that. So um, when I got to college, like I kind of stopped but I was still part time on. So um, second year college came. It was a normal day, next thing you know, I've, like, I've just done what I needed to do before I came to college and I still got whatever I got on me like, while I'm in college. And basically, I was just sitting there doing my work, next thing you know, the teacher said, Mortimer, we need you to come outside. And I said, alright, cool, so I'm ready, to, I'm ready to jump up, go, and like, everything. Next thing you know, the teacher's like, oh, we, you need to bring your bag as well. I'm like, yo, this is peak. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? And these times, like, these times, like, apparently my bag was stinking, but I didn't, I didn't realize it. So next thing you know, I'm walking. Teachers like to me. Um, I'm like to him, what's going on? What's wrong? He's like, oh, basically, I just need to talk to you. And I goes, tell me what's going on. What's going on then? And he said, nah, I'll talk to you when we get to the room. So we got to the room. Next thing I know, I see security there. So I'm like, okay, things are starting to add up. What's going on? Next thing I know, I see the security putting on um, plastic gloves. And I was thinking, huh? Like, what's really going on? Next thing you know, they said to me, they read something out about, um, about like weapons, about knives and drugs, and they have like intelligence that I've got it. So I was like, ah. Oh. I, got, I ain't got any knives or anything, but I got the drugs. So I just said, you know what? Let me, like, honesty, the best policy, in it. So I just said, you know what? Like, it's, I knew what was gonna happen when I, when I got involved in this life. So, like, let me just see where it goes, innit? So basically, they said to me, do you have any drugs? I said, yeah. So they looked in my bag, they couldn't find it. So I took it out and I said, there it is. So really and truly, if I didn't say anything, I could have just got away with it. But at something just said to me, just, just thinking, let's see where it goes, innit? So yeah, I got kicked out of college for that. But also, because I was still always in my lessons, I was always on time, I was never late, I was never bunking, all the acid, every single teacher said that. So they, for them, it was like, he said, he's, one of, he's one of the campus's biggest drug dealers, but he's always in lesson, he's always got manners, all the teachers like him. What can we do? So I've gone in for a panel um, to see what's going on with like to say if they should keep me or not. That they ended up saying, "No, nah, we're not keeping you." But because of everything that the teachers have said, like you can you can finish your exams. So I was at home. I stopped drug dealing, stopped smoking, and everything. So um, I was just doing my work. These times I got full marks in my B in my business B tech, and I weren't even in class. I got an A star, distinction star. And um, with music, I got a, I got, what did I get? I got a merit. I got a merit in music. 
and sociology, I've got a D, that's still a pass. But these times, I'm not even in lesson. So when I do come into college to pick up work, and especially at business, my business teachers getting onto the class, getting onto them. When I mean getting onto them, getting onto them, keep on saying, this boy, he's not even in class, but he's got full marks. Half of you lot haven't even done your work, but he's still done his work. And like, I'm just like, okay, but I'm the bad one, isn't it? <laughs> like, well, that, that don't make sense. So, yeah, I got, so I got all my qualifications. Um, I mo I've moved to Liverpool to do uni. Um, I was doing social work. I was doing social work in uni. I was um, also, as a volunteer, I was working in a community centre as well. So, I already had the hurdle of, of college and maybe not even going to uni, but I got through that. So, I'm doing uni, I'm living my life, like, partying, drinking, smoking, everything you can, everything uni, uni students were doing, I was involved in it. I was involved. So, yeah, so I was doing all of that, doing all of that. Then, next thing you know, I started hearing voices. And I started deeply thinking into things. Next thing you know, at the end, at the end, at the end of uni, I tried, I tried killing myself by drinking bleach. So it was deep. It was deep. So went into a mental home for like a month or two. Came out. Wasn't smoking anymore. Tried like just trying to sort everything back out. But same time, my mum never went in. And she's always stressing me to go uni. Not, not stressing me in a bad way, but because she wants me to see me do good. You see what I'm saying? So I was like, ah, cool. I've got to do this for mum, not just for myself. You see what I'm saying? So I went back to uni. Went back to drinking, smoking, everything. And then next thing you know, I came back home. Came back home one day, just smoked a spliff. So I just said, Mortimer, kill yourself. I said, bro. So these times, I've jumped in my car, I've driven all the way to the, to the Luton Town Centre. Everyone knows where that is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Luton Town Centre, the swelly car park. Drove there. What was weird, I'd, I, parked at, I parked up in the same spot I normally park at any time I go into the town without even thinking about it. These times, I'm chilling, I'm smoking a cigarette, I'm chilling, chilling, just looking down. Like I'm sitting on the edge, just just looking around, just looking at the looking at the whole scenery of Luton. I'm just looking around, but I'm feeling so depressed. These times I'm running from my thoughts. I'm paranoid. I'm hearing voices constantly. So I'm there now. I've closed my car. I'm just standing there smoking, smoking a cigarette, just thinking about life and just saying, you know what? It's time to go, innit? It's literally time to go. So next thing you know. I just sent a text out to all my friends and family and said to them, I can't do this no more. But I love you lot, but I can't do this anymore. Put my phone back in my car, locked my car, literally just sat on the edge and then just jumped. So I literally, I literally jumped from a five-story building. Like, after, do you know what? Sometimes, I'm, I, look, I, I was there the other day, I looked at it and I said, you know what? It's mad that man survived. It's mad, but it's a blessing. So I'm saying. It's a, it's a, it's a real blessing. It's a real blessing. But it was like I jumped. And the thing about it is, like, I've got to make jokes about these things. So I'm saying, I've got to make jokes about these things. When, when, when I was in hospital, my uncle came up to me. Cause he's a guy who just jokes, it hit him heavy. But he made a joke and he said to me, you thought you were R. Kelly, innit? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, uncle, you know what it is, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, so obviously I'm in hospital now for like, I'm in hospital now for three months. I was in a coma for like two weeks. So like, it was deep. It was deep, don't get twisted. It was deep. But it was one of those things where I just said, you know what? 
Like, there's, there's a reason why man's here. There's a reason why man's here. Like, all the, the, those, those three months, those three months in high school, like, mentally, it was mad because these times I weren't even in Luton and Dunstable. I was all the way in Royal London. I had to get airlifted. And the thing about it is, I would I, I literally, when I dropped to the floor, apparently I was still conscious. So it wasn't like I was unconscious. I was still on the floor. I was still like, uh, uh, still on the floor. And I just jumped from a, from a five-story building. These times, there was a doctor on a bus. He jumped off, he saw me drop, jump off the bus, and he put me, he put me into a sleep. So if it wasn't for him, I, I wouldn't be here right now. So he put me into a sleep, and I got airlifted. So three months, it was just cold toast, coffee in the morning. Like, obviously you got my three meals and the three meals, but <laughs> it was good. That's why my belly's like this. <laughs> it was good, it was good, like. Like these times, I'm a, I'm around. I was the, the youngest person on the whole the whole ward. So there's there's loads of older people. I'm just the youngest the youngest one there. Everyone's looking like, what? How how comes he's here? These times, I was in I was in intensive care at one point for like two for two weeks. These times, my mum's not even sure if I'm gonna live or not. So it's deep. It's deep. So. These times, I'm on the, I've got moved to a different ward. I'm, I'm conscious, I'm eating and everything. And I met someone who was about 97. This guy was about 97. My man could walk like Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> walk, when I say walk, walk. Like, and he showed, he showed me, like, see life? Life has its ups and downs. But, same same time with those ups and downs, you still gotta live for it because there's other people around you. When you may not feel like like no one loves you, there's people they love you in it. They might not show that all the time, but they love you in it. So it was deep. So what I realized when I was there, I was like, it was it was just thinking about the whole thing, the whole situation. Like man survived death. Like literally death in it. Because anyone who's trying to jump from there is literally trying to die in it. Man survived death. You know what I'm saying? So it was one of those things where I was like, you know what? It's deep. Because I still don't want to be here, but I'm here. What can man do? You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I'm back at the start again. Because these times I was working on my career. You know what I'm saying? I was working on my career, I was trying to change my life around, I weren't even trying to be back on the road. But then I'm in a situation where I could potentially, when I get back up and I'm like back up on my feet and stuff, I could be back on the road because man, man ain't going to be ready to go uni mentally. So it was one of those things where I have to say, you know what, like, you got to now find your fulfillment of what God has put you on earth to do. You know what I'm saying? So, I found that my story moved a lot of people. It moved a lot of people because same time I was double-sided. So, there was a stage where I couldn't even see. I had to wear glasses. And the, the doctor, I remember the doctors, the doctor saying that potentially this guy, this guy may not be able to walk again. Now I'm walking, I can run. So I'm saying, same time with my eyes. When I went to the to the people about the eyes, they said to me, "We feel that you've damaged, you've damaged a certain part in your eye, and if that is damaged, it's hard to, it's hard for it to, to ever come back." They're saying that you need surgery for that to come back. Randomly on an Easter Sunday, my eyesight came back. Randomly. Same, same time, I had, a, I had a split valve. I had a split valve. So I landed on my right side, and the right side is my good side. 
So I broke my, my elbow, my, my shoulder, and all my ribs on the, on the right hand side. So you know, when man them are busting jokes, I'm feeling pain, but I can't stop laughing, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so I broke all the ribs on, on my right hand side and um, my pelvis as well. So because um, I have a feeling that due to the way I landed on my ribs and broke my ribs that it ended up having, um, it ended up basically like cutting open one of my valves. So I, so I had a split valve. So I was like very, when I was breathing, I used to breathe very deep. If I walk, I'd get out of breath quick. So I ended up having an open, open heart surgery. So that's when they, they open your, your whole chest, open in it. <laughs> they open it, yeah? They open it. So yeah, I had that, I was in surgery for like five hours. I was in surgery for like five hours. And like, that took a couple months to recover as well. But like, all these things I'm trying to show you is that anytime you feel low, anytime anyone feels low, because the thing about it is, everyone has mental health. You know what I'm saying? All it takes, all it takes is one thing to trigger it. We all, the thing about it is, we all know that our life has ups and downs. But the thing about it is, we never know which down could actually make us hit rock bottom. We never know that. But all I'm trying to show you lot is this. Anytime you feel down, when that down comes, and if you feel your lo at your lowest, your lowest, your lowest, I'm telling you, suicide is not the one. Because once you live it, if you live through that, I'm telling you, it messes with your brain heavily. Because you think about where you could have been before you, before you, you tried committing suicide and where you're at now. So I'm saying? So it's deep. But put, putting that all, all to the back, because I don't really like talking about this stuff. Because I'm not really that person, you know what I'm saying? I'm not really that person. I'm normally a happy person who busts jokes, you know what I'm saying? But like, the way I look at it is things happen, you know what I'm saying? And God, God gives what a man could bear in it, you know what I'm saying? I could bear that. Even though it was a lot of pain, I could bear that, yeah? But I'm showing you that, like, like boss man said, yeah? <laughs> like boss man said, you see ideas, yeah? Don't ever, don't ever sit on the idea and think, you know what, let me not put that out there. Because it's a thing where, for, for a long time, I've been working on my music for a long time. But then what I started to realize is that, like when I was doing this music thing, all I was talking about is like drugs, drugs and money, you know what I'm saying? Drugs and money. Like the drug thing wasn't something that I wanted to stay in. But because I was living it, I was putting that out in the universe. Every time I said a lyric, I was putting it out in the universe and that meant that I would stay in it because I keep on talking about it and putting it out in the universe. Yeah? So it was deep. But now I use my music to, to tell people about my experience, but also to actually give indicators to people when potentially they're, they're on the verge of having a mental breakdown. So there's things like this. You're not eating that much. You're not sleeping that much. You're looking, you're looking for, for things to, to distract yourself from life and detach yourself from life, such as drugs. Those things, like, I'm not saying to people, don't take drugs. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is be very careful because it was cannabis that was my drug. Cannabis. It, weren't no, it wasn't crack cocaine, it wasn't heroin, it wasn't, it wasn't spice, it wasn't, it wasn't none of that. It was herb. Herb. See what I'm saying? But same way, I'm showing people that don't abuse drugs. Don't abuse it. If you are going to use it, do not abuse it. Because the thing about it is, it will end up, it will end up turning itself around. Before cannabis used to make me feel hungry, it used to make me feel sleepy. After a while, I started, I, I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to eat. See what I'm saying? So it, it proper messed with man. But in the same way, it's not for everyone. 
Certain people can smoke every single day for how many years and be fine. Certain people it's not for. And I realize it's not for me. But it's deep. It's deep. Um, I myself have suffered from depression for a number of years and um, I decided to express myself through poetry. So this one I titled Chaotic Mind. My mind is in chaos and you, not, you cannot see the damage those voices are doing to me. I hear them both night and day, just wishing they would go away. One on the left, one on the right, both of them having a bite in my head, not letting go, all these emotions in full flow. Where do I go? Where do I begin? Which emotion will I let out? Which one will I keep in? These people keep watching me all the time, but they don't understand what is going on in my mind. Those judgments you pass don't help me, as you don't know my journey. Try walking a day in my shoes and have those voices confuse you. My future looks bleak and I, and I ponder what if, should I? I wonder what life would be without me, would all these voices set me free? I took back control in an instant when I realised suicide was imminent. Who are, they, who are these voices to say how I live my life anyway? I embarked on a journey of change and substance was no longer part of the game. I had to let it go before it took me places I didn't want to go. Paranoia was ruining my life and I was sick of all the strife. It was time to let it go, speak up, embrace self-love and grow into a better version of me by sharing part of my journey. Thank you. Obviously, whoever was here on time will know I was speaking Tell earlier. Them. Them. But before I start, I just want to take my hat off to you, Mortimer, because Woo! I suffer from mental health. I have a touch where you touch, and it was hard enough for me. So I respect you for coming up here and giving it to us. Um, basically, as you've been told, I've got to be quick. So, my mum went to Jamaica to bury my aunt when I was 10. She came back with mosquito bites that were so bad they ate straight through her an ankles. There was no flesh. She's got sick, sick, sickle cell. I've got sickle cell as well. So in that same year, my little brother was born. In that same year, she got married to my little brother's dad. In that same year, I was going to secondary school. My mum couldn't afford to buy me the bag I wanted to have, or the coat I wanted to have, or the trainers I wanted to have. So, I started to sell drugs. Then, my belief was at the start, I was selling it for the right reasons, reality. Cause I didn't want to put extra pressure on my mum. She got made um, redundant, it's called, because of her legs. So I'm saying I've got to fund myself. So I've touched the road, doing what I'm doing. I started to sell weed, went to heroin crack, and my reasons for doing it changed slowly but surely. Instead of me doing it for the right reasons, to take pressure off my mum, to like make me feel good, I started to do it because the money was good, the lifestyle was good, what I was getting, it was great. That's the reality, I'm not gonna lie to none of you. During that time, I went to jail three times. The first time I was 17, I loved it. I was young, I was enjoying it. The second time, I was 21. I loved it, I was enjoying it, because I was that age where it's fun, innit? I've got a name on the road, so you've got a name in the jail. After I came out the second time, 2006, I had my first daughter. Then 2011, I had my second daughter. During the whole time, I was still selling drugs. Like, I had about eight people working for me. I was, I don't know, I'm from London. I've been arrested for this already, so I can tell you. I had my drug line from Enfield all the way up to Hertfordshire, along the whole A10, if any of you don't know it. And I got arrested five years ago, basically. And it wasn't me getting arrested that stopped me doing what I'm doing. It's this time I went to prison, and I done two and a half years from that five, and I never saw my daughters. I never made them come and see me in the prison, because I didn't want them to get searched. I didn't want him to have to be around dogs. I didn't want him to have to look at the gates, the British flag, 
go back to school, tell the school they're going to see their dad in prison. So I made myself suffer. I made them think I was in Jamaica. I made my family send me over t-shirts, postcards, pens, pencils, and I'll send them back out through the prison to my kids at home. That kept them going through the two and a half years. What it done to me was it made me realize that that 86,000 pounds that I got arrested with, and I'll tell you all again, 86,000 pounds, collectively money, jewelry, drugs, cars, I done two and a half years and I come out with less than 300 pounds. And my relationship with my eldest daughter was dead. I mean, my youngest daughter was dead. If I didn't have my eldest daughter there to help me bring back that relationship, it's now I still tell you I've got one child. That broke me down to the very end. And that's made me say all the wrongs that I've done in my life, and maybe even the word wrong is wrong to use, because there was other dealers out there that would physically, violently force your child to sell drugs. I wasn't forcing no child to sell drugs. I was just paying them, trainers, tracksuits, that's the reality. And I said to myself, I damaged so many kids growing up, I'm gonna give back to what I've damaged. I've taken too much, so I'm gonna give back. I came out of jail, I was driving um, HDB trucks for like nine months. I was getting paid about £15 an hour on my doorstep. Tottenham, North London. And then someone got me a job in a care home in Bedford, working with 16 to 18 year olds that have no mums and dads. I get paid eight pound an hour to do that. And I travel from Tottenham to Bedford. So that should show you where my heart and my mind is that I've taken a, basically a, a half a pay cut. I'm traveling 50 miles when I could have just traveled five to do my job. So I'm not doing my job now for money. I'm not doing my job now for you to say, well done, I'm doing my job. So maybe in two, three years, a youth man can say to me, thank you, can you stop me from going where you went? <laughs> As for the mental health side, I'll tell you now, anyone that's been in a gang, where I've come from and you can probably work out, you have mental health issues. Remember I tell you, whether it be depression, anxiety, personality disorder, whatever, but you got it. I just didn't know it until I stepped out of a gang. I stepped out of that gang on my last sentence. Reason being, I was raised from zero to 19, not to 20 soon, thinking someone else was my dad. I didn't see him much anyway, but I thought that was my dad, innit? On my second sentence, my real dad came to see me, but it didn't influence my mind because I was still on the road doing badness. So you just block that out. On my last sentence, thinking about my kids, not seeing my kids, that made me able to not open up to deal with it, but to accept it and try and get help. So I started counseling from inside prison. I've been out next, like December the 10th, I've been at two and a half years. And what I can say is if I didn't if I didn't accept my mental health issues and try and deal with them, no no one or no power or no force could have kept me from going back apart from my kids. What I'm trying to say is, everyone, and it's no disrespect to anyone in this room, but everyone in this room has got a mask on. It's just how big that mask is, or how much of your face that mask covers. Until you're willing to accept things that have happened in your life previously, that mask is gonna stay on your face. I've only been able to give back and do good, because I've been able to take that mask. Don't get me wrong, in the two and a half years, I've had about three major breakups where I've hit the floor. And I've been missing from everyone for months. But do you know what? I said to myself, I've been there, and I'm gonna come back from it. I'm not gonna let it beat me. I was in prison with sickle cell. When I'm on the road, 
I get attacked maybe once every two years. For those of you who don't know, a simple cell is where your oxygen cells can't pass through your blood cells, so your body can't breathe. So in the two and a half years I was in jail, I had eight attacks. I've been out two and a half years, I've had one attack. You get what I'm saying? All these little things I try and say back to the youth that I try and mentor now, that life is not worth it. It's not worth it. I've done everything that you can think of. I've seen everything you that can think of. I've got a big dirty chop in my head. If I didn't close my eye, I would have, I would have lost it. I would have lost it. But what I'm trying to say to you is like, the respect I get now from men that are still on the road as gangsters is more than I got when I was on the road as a gangster with them. Because my philosophy is, I'm just gonna hand pick someone here, I, I'm just looking. I'm going to pick you, I'm just assuming. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But when you was in school, you sat down and you listened. No? Nah? Well, someone put their hand up. Who was in school that sat down and listened? Somebody. All right, thank you. So when I give my talks to my youths, and I'll, I'll use their teacher, a youth, as an example, I say to them, who do you think is a stronger member? Your teacher that sat his ass down in school and stayed in school, scholarly, college, uni, maybe not, or me, that left school, or kicked out whatever evil way, and I went down that road. And they say to me, me, I'm saying, why? Car, you got the name, you got this, you got that, but I'm saying, bro, that made me weak-minded. I am the weaker person than my man that stayed in his school seat and finished school. So, again, I'll say, it. the reason why I do my job now, I just want to help and change as many youth lives as possible to not make them go down the route that I went down. I gave my mum and my gran, they're the only two people in my life really like that. I gave them so much stress. Even up to today sometimes, I can't even look in my gran's face. But why I can afterwards, it's because she always says, you've made me so proud that I've changed. So that's my story. Um, thanks for coming guys, wicked turnout. Dee, thanks for putting this on. Um, I think this is very needed. We need to do like more events like this. Yes, yes. The community need to hear certain things, so well done. Uh, well done to the three guys, I don't know if they're still here, but two, two guys I went to school with um, grew up in Lucy Farm to see them coming so far and doing what they do and cooking some good food. I don't know if you like ate, but it's some good food. So well done to them as well. Um, now, but my company, Directional, um, like Lisa, my name's Jermaine, and I started the company five years ago. Um, and what we do, we work in high schools in, in Luton and provisions, alternative provisions, behaviour schools in Luton, um, working with young people trying to raise their aspirations. Um, our ethos or our slogan is inspiring the next generation, and that is what we're passionate about doing. I've got some of my team members here with me today. Um, all of us have grown up in Luton. I grew up in Lucy Farm. Um, at a time, I couldn't come around here. I couldn't come to Marsh Farm because I wouldn't get back safe. So, you know, I was involved, same with these guys, um, involved in everything you see today. It's just a lot worse um, nowadays. The reason I started the company is because I saw so many of my friends um, make bad decisions. So I've got some that have done really well, some that have made it onto TV, made it into professional football, um, but some that made the wrong decisions, ended up going to jail, being stabbed, and all the rest of it. Um, See, knife crime is, is a massive topic at the moment and this is what, we've got a program called Take the Lead and this is what we're really dedicating ourselves to at the moment because it is really is getting out of hand. Um, people say, did the police do enough? Maybe, maybe not. Some people say, did the teachers, did the schools do enough? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the parents do enough? Maybe, maybe not. Um, did the community do enough? Again. Maybe, maybe not. We're trying to do our best, but are we doing enough? I don't know. Is all the companies out there doing their own thing? Is everyone doing enough? Again, I don't know. I think we need to come together a lot more, um, whether it's parents, parents, teachers, police, community workers, even if you're, you know, you don't have a, a child, even if you um, are not a community worker, you can still do something to try and influence these youths the right way. 
Um, it's about having role models, positive role models. Um, like I say, you don't need to have a child to do that. You don't need to be in a certain profession to be able to do that. You just need to be able to speak to the young person the right way. Um, our thing is at the moment we educate, so we do little presentations, we do lessons to try and educate them on knife crime, on serious youth violence. Um, we engage them, so most of the time we use sport or music to try and engage them and build those relationships. And the last one, and for me the most important one, is to empower them. Um, because a lot of these young people, they feel like they have nothing, or they can be nothing. Um, I actually said to one of them the other week, and I, he took it the wrong way, um, but choosing that life to be on the roads, um, to be selling drugs, it's, it's lazy because it's easy. Yeah. If you're around it, it's easy to get involved in that. It's harder, like Leon was just saying, it's harder to sit down in school. It's harder to pay attention. It's harder to start your own business. It's harder to get into a career and go through all the hurdles and make it to the top. But it's worth it when you get there. Um, we, uh, when I tell a story in, in one of the lessons and I heard it off a motivational speaker. Does anyone have any pets? No any pets? What have you got? Dog. Dog? Dog? Anyone got cats? I hate cats, by the way. I hate them. Sorry if anyone loves cats. But what do, what do dogs and cats get that, that are annoying or are taken to the vet for? Flea. Fleas. Fleas, when a flea is born, a flea has a potential to jump 30 centimetres. So obviously flea, you can't even see it, but it can jump 30 centimetres. That's how it gets from dog to dog to cat to cat. Yeah. If you put a flea in a jar that's 20 centimetres tall, and they try and jump that 30 centimetres, the flea's going to bang his head. Thanks. Continuously bang... This one's even worse. <laughs> Continuously bang its head on the top of the jar. Yeah, so that flea is going to learn to jump 19 centimetres. Correct? So it stops banging its head. If you put another flea in there, female flea, she'll do the same thing. Jump 19 centimetres. Those fleas reproduce the baby flea. What is that baby flea? What the, does it have the potential to jump? It has the potential to jump 30 centimetres. Because every flea is born with the potential to jump 30 centimetres. What will it learn to jump? 19 centimetres because of its parents, because of its environment. This is exactly the same with human beings. If we're around people, whether it's parents, whether it's older brothers or sisters, friends in schools, teachers, all these people, if they hit a certain level, that's what we aspire to be. Most of us. Yeah. I grew up in a council house, um, mum and dad still live in a council house. Went on one holiday in my whole upbringing. Holidays were my thing, so I used to go to Carter Newman. When you come back from a six weeks holiday, first thing people ask you, where did you go on holiday? I went to Lucy Park every, every single day. Troy was there, you were there with me. <laughs> <laughs> playing football, playing basketball. I thought I had the best summer ever until I come back and everyone's gone France, skiing, Disneyland, Portugal. And it affected me. You think embarrassed. You know, the older you get, the more embarrassed you get. Oh, I've not been away anywhere. Like, so what's a holiday? I've never seen a plane. So for me, that's why I wanted to be successful, make my own money. Now, you know, I've gone on holiday, I've been to Amsterdam, Paris, Jamaica, Brazil, Dubai, Mexico. I've been to it, I've done it all. Because that's what my aspirations were. I didn't want to settle like my parents did and just go on one holiday in five years. So what we need to do for these young people is help them to take the lid off their jar. We don't need to hold them back. Sometimes people do it unintentionally. So my parents always wanted the best for me. Eh? My mum was like, probably caring, caring, probably too much, a little bit. <laughs> don't tell her I said that. Um, but when I first come out of employment, started my company, every single day texting me, have you applied for another job? Have you got a job yet? Are you in a job yet? Are you in a job yet? That's her putting the lid on my job. We have to be careful how we speak to these young people. We have to be careful what we're saying to them, what we're advising them. We need to tell them to aim for the stars. Dream big, like Diana the Vapor said, she was saying. Dream big, have big dreams. Yeah? Things, social media can put a lid on their jar. Like I say, parents, teachers, unintentionally, older family members can unintentionally put a lid on that jar. We need to help them raise aspirations because in the long run, that will help with knife crime.
it'll help with them selling drugs. If they aspire to be something and they realize these things will hold them back, they're gonna stop doing them. I don't think there's a solution for, you know, ended, not one solution for ending knife crime. So people say to me all the time, first of all, why do the kids carry knives? Multiple reasons why they do. How can you stop it? Multiple ways you can stop knife crime or try to help prevent it. For me, that's just one. And that's one we don't really look at enough. So all I'd say, I'll finish on, please try and help our young people take the lid off their jar and aim for the stars.